Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. The text for 12th Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on August 23rd, 2020, are Isaiah chapter 51, 1 through 6. The semi-continuous reading is Exodus chapter 1, verse 8 through 210. Our psalm is 138. We continue in our reading through the uh, letter to the Romans, chapter 12, 1 through 8. And our gospel reading is chapter 16, 13 through 20, Caesarea Philippi. And the question Matt has been waiting for us to be answering. Who do people say that I am? That one? That one. I thought it was, have you been there? Because I, I have been there. Yeah. I mean, I after this, there. we don't know exactly where he was, but you know, I've been but, to the Temple of Pan. It was a good time. Yes. Pan's temple is very fascinating. It certainly is. You know, this is most, most of our listeners probably know this is the a turning point, if not the turning point in the story of Jesus' public ministry. And it, things will head in a new direction. You'll get more of that next week. But it's an important question to ask at any time because we are always, uh, I would say, course correcting or always determining what does it mean to preach Christ? What does it mean to preach Christ as Lord? What does it mean to preach Christ crucified? And those are evergreen questions that we have confessions and other traditions to help us with them, but we're always giving voice to the gospel in certain ways. So a good thing to lead your church into here in the latter days of August. Well, I love that. I love that turn here in this, uh, in this interchange between Jesus and, uh, and the disciples that, from that third person, who do um, who do people say? But who do you? Second person, uh, and that that's that's one place certainly to linger in this particular uh, passage. Is is yeah? There's a lot of there's a lot of things that get said about Jesus that they that the you know the uh, ubiquitous they. Uh, but what what do you say? And on what do you stake your uh, your your belief in Jesus and your uh, the way in which you live out your life, and I think that there's there's a there's a lot of importance of, around that as a preacher to be able to come alongside your congregation and and accompany them in being able to articulate who Jesus is for them uh, on their own and not uh, well this is what I have to believe or this is what other people say I should believe. And so how is it that they come to their own um, confessional claim of Jesus, who Jesus is and what they will stake you know, their lives on? I think it's, uh, I think it's always a uh, worthwhile, worthwhile direction for a sermon on this passage. There also might be, um, um, I've, I've often been uh, troubled by the fact that they've, they're affirmed at this uh, who Jesus is and then told not to tell anyone. Um, and uh, I, for me, I think uh, if I were going to uh, approach that portion of the text, um, I would remind folks that sometimes we have to be patient with what we've found out before we shove it down the throat of someone else that uh, sometimes we have to live into what this really means for ourselves. Um, you can get excited with information and you know, force it upon someone else as if they don't need to take the same journey of learning who Jesus is that you've taken. It's a good way of putting it, Joy, I think. It usually gets put in the context of, well, he hasn't gone through cross and resurrection yet, so you're bound to misinterpret who he is. But the story of cross and resurrection, at least of resurrection, is very much a personal one, right? How do you come to encounter the risen Christ? So it's not just, or the problem at this point in the story isn't just not enough time has elapsed yet, but they have not yet gotten to the point where they've been able to come to an understanding of who Jesus is. And in fact, at the end of Matthew, they don't fully. We still have people who are doubting. It's still, still a lot of confusion 
in Matthew 28 when the curtain comes down. Thanks very much for that, Matt. You're, yep, you're absolutely spot on, yeah. So, so just good. we're really good together. Just notice uh, that next week's text uh, follows directly on this one. So peek ahead. Um, that it's really uh, it's 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 ripe for a two part series because uh, in next week's text he begins to show it says teach I think in the other synaptics about what it means for him to be to be Messiah. So you've got the confession. Oftentimes these parts in other gospels I think are. Um, can't remember, but I think the lecture we might put them all in one Sunday uh, in Mark, but here it's separated. So you get the you get the confession, and then these words that have meant a lot in the history of interpretation. I give to you the keys of the kingdom. Uh, you know, you're the rock on which um, I will build my church. Uh, does he say the key? Yeah, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and so. What does that mean uh, in that text? I mean, that that, that little piece of it uh, hasn't meant very much to Protestants, but it, uh, it means a lot to Catholics. Well, I you know that is a, a, a critical portion of this of this passage, and you know, going back to uh, your discussion, Matt and Joy, with regard to. Uh, understanding who Jesus is or understanding when will we ever come to that full uh, full understanding of Jesus identity and Jesus purpose really sheds some sort of I think corrective light <laughs> on verse 19 uh, that that before you be, before you are really really quick to claim that ultimate authority which I, I'm interpreting the keys of the kingdom to be of a of a of an authority to interpret Jesus teaching uh, it's it's there's a there's a caveat in part in there i think or a not, maybe not a caveat but a caution uh, it's not that Jesus is taking that away but there's this reality of yeah you do have you do have this authority this is what i've been training you to do going back again to the uh, to the Sermon on the Mount, and and that part of this is this binding and loosing is this interpreting interpreting my teachings and what do they mean, um, and what do they mean for uh, living out the uh, the potential of the kingdom of heaven, uh, but that's also uh, that's also in the in the reality or in light of the fullness of what all that means hasn't yet come to fruition. And so I think there's a tension there. I feel a tension there between that, that promise of that authority, but at the same time, there's not full understanding yet of the meaning of the Messiah. So uh, that's, that's an interesting tension for me anyway, in that yeah, it, portion. It, and if that's going to be a, a part of the direction you go, you should also then look ahead to Matthew 18, 15 through 20, where uh, Jesus uses the same language in terms of uh, giving it to all of the church. So it's not just to Peter, it's, but it's to all of the church. And there it's in the context of sin and uh, what happens when someone within the community um, refuses to um, uh, refuses to listen to the members of the community that are calling them out. Are we ready okay. to go to Isaiah? Anything more on that? Let's look at Isaiah. Well, every time we get this passage, I'm always like, okay, the, the connection to Isaiah is rocks. So I would preach on rocks. And uh, I'd have a, it's a great opportunity for, uh, for a uh, prop sermon. You could bring in piles of rocks, different kinds of rocks. No, I know there's, a, I know there's another connection. Anybody want to share that with me? I'm not so sure uh, bringing, bringing in rocks is going to work for the days if we're uh, still preaching from a distance, but you could take your little webcam and go outside and look at the foundation of your building, depending upon what kind of a building you have, and talk a bit about uh, why things are built. You could get somebody who uh, is, a, is a mason, small m mason, to have them describe uh, their work and, and what it looks like to think about a laying a foundation or setting a foundation, cornerstones, things like that. Could go to a quarry. You could go to a quarry, or as I like to call it, a quarry. And you could uh, you could go there, and you I mean you could just you could unpack a metaphor that 
is utterly unfamiliar to me, child of the suburbs, and help get a sense for, for why this is important. And because it's not, these aren't the only two passages that talk about, that use this kind of language. To describe heritage, to describe past, to describe knowing your identity and preserving, or having that identity be preserved into the future. It's a really hard text for me to understand. I mean, it's, it, you know, it's part of Second Isaiah, and it's about the promise of a, God's transforming power fundamentally altering a negative reality that, in this case, the people were experiencing and turning it all upside down so that the waste places become like the Garden of Eden um, and joy and gladness become uh, the new norm. Uh, so it, it, that I understand, but uh, the, some of the other parts of it are more difficult for me. I think the faithfulness of God in um, uh, the time lapse of seeing um, that, that over time God is doing what God has always promised, beginning with the promise that was made to Abraham and Sarah. Um, uh, I think that, that holding on to that, that firm foundation uh, to go with the rock that uh, you, Caroline, and Matt were, were referencing, um, I, I just think that putting that hope right there uh, in God to see the fruitfulness you've described, uh, Ralph, um, in, in turning what is the most chaotic, uh, the most destructive, uh, the most hurtful into um, paradise. Let's turn and talk about the uh, semi-continuous. Uh, the last two weeks, we jumped all the way through the story of Joseph in just two texts. And then uh, now we go ahead 500 years or something um, that uh, the, story of, the story of Genesis ends with the promises to Abram and Sarai um, partially kept. They've become, they've become uh, a, 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 a numerous people. And now down, at, down here in Exodus, it says the Israelite people are numerous and powerful. So they've become, uh, so that piece of the ancestral promise has been kept, but they're not in the land and they're not free. So they're not a nation. They're a numerous people, but they're not a nation. They're not free. And if I'm preaching this week, this is what I'm for sure going with. Um, first of all, it's got this great line, which um, has... Uh, fit many times in my life. Uh, now a new king arose over Egypt who knew not Joseph, who did not know Joseph. And what does that mean? You know, just not knowing the source of blessing and not knowing your story, not knowing the institution that you're now leading, you know, that it's uh, how many times has my life felt like this? Um, but then the really powerful thing to me is um, where does God's deliverance start coming. God's deliverance starts coming through the least powerful people you can imagine. Um, two midwives who are barren uh, in the story, Shifra and Pua. And in the ancient world, the, the power differential between Pharaoh and these two midwives to the uh, Hebrews, to the Israelites, um, Shifra and Pua, you can't get farther than that. But where is God's uh, revolutionary power? Uh, where is God's agency being enacted? It's with these women. And then there's more women in the story. So I mean, Exodus starts out with, with it's, uh, it's an absolutely revolutionary um, picture of where God's um, power starts to work. I would call this sermon, Five Bold Women. Uh, or five women who, you know, who, like you said, know God's character. Uh, and could, because you have these, the two, you have the two Hebrew um, midwives, but you have Moses's mother, Moses's sister, and Pharaoh's daughter that are all uh, a part of upending <laughs> the, the plans of Pharaoh. And so I would, I, I, I that's what I, I, five bold women or five, five women or whatever and just and and tell their story and like you said Rolf that there's a story that 
uh, that 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 they are really yielding. They are really yielding the power of God uh, and 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 the potential of what God uh, what God and the potential of God's plan. That's what I would do. That's my sermon. There's the sermon title. <laughs> I love it, um, R- Ralph. Last week, um, uh, I think it was you that uh, drew attention uh, to the fact that. Um, we have these two opportunities to tell the whole of Joseph's story. And um, I I usually tell this story by asking the question, how do you not know Joseph? I mean, you you know, that would be like um, African-Americans not knowing Martin Luther King at the inauguration of Obama. I mean, how do you not know Joseph? And for those of us with a biblical imagination born of preaching, it's because we haven't told the story. Um, and I, I just, I have to throw that in there in terms of why, how important it is for us to tell all of the pieces of this story behind the text uh, as much as we possibly can. Um, the the uh, way that I would preach this, uh, Caroline, would be a twist. Um, and uh, the title of the sermon uh, would be um, um, Hashtag Midwives Matter. Uh, because uh, as Ralph has already pointed out, this is the, the absolute other end of the spectrum of power. And yet their actions, not being sucked into the po- position of power, not being sucked into the promises that could have been made uh, by this, uh, uh, this uh, um, uh, Pharaoh, they chose to do the right thing and do more than let the girls live. And that is what is so powerful in this, in this story. That's how I do it. We are providing exegetical insight. We are even providing sermon titles, multiple sermon titles. We just need now signs for the, ideas for the signs in front of the church out in the, out in the road. This is your one-stop sermon resource place. That's fantastic. It's a great story of, of very simple acts of defiance. None of these people have an outright revolution in mind, at least not counting Pharaoh's daughter, the other four. They just want to do the next thing right, whether that's making sure this next baby lives or for Moses' mother. I mean, what gets her to the point where she thinks putting her baby in a basket and floating him down the river is the best thing she can do for him? I mean, the, the pain in that, the agony that's part of that backstory. Uh, and then Miriam or whoever, if this is another sister or not, we don't know, who decides I'm going to tag along and watch what happens. I mean, it's just, these are each people just trying to figure out what does it mean to be faithful in the moment or to bear witness to justice in the moment, which is something we all can do, right? You look around, you figure out what's the next thing. Romans, right? Or no, we have a psalm. 138. Here we go. I, I would always uh, point people to the commentary on the website. Uh, my friend Dennis Tucker. Uh, they're all my friends that do the Psalms. Not true, but uh, Dennis is a friend. Uh, as was Steve uh, Reed, their colleagues down at Baylor. He does a nice job uh, with the text. Uh, to me, the hard thing about the text, about um, so uh, this particular psalm in this particular context is um, I have felt so um, I felt so lost in exile without being able to be part of a singing community. Um, the thing I, besides the very act of being together with my congregation that I've missed since March is I've especially missed being. Uh, together with the congregations in order to sing. And this text, you know, talks about it right up, right up the top. And, and it's, um, it's just, uh, it's painful, uh, frankly, uh, to come across texts like this in the Psalms and then uh, not know really what to do with them without being able to be together. I just, I guess, I, I mean, I realize that's not really a helpful direction for preaching, but uh, I have to be honest. It might um, 
remind us of the importance of um, of of praising. Why is it important to be told uh, um, to praise? Uh, why is it important for us to practice praising? Um, I, I think you just set that up, Ralph, uh, in terms of whether folks are able to name it or not, uh, what it means to have lost that corporate activity and that it really is vital for sustaining our faith life. Theologically, um, the, to me, the heart of the psalm is uh, a really theology of the cross moment uh, in verse 6 and following. Uh, For the, though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he perceives from far away. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve me. That uh, the cross teaches us uh, and reinforces what we learn from the Old Testament so often is that God meets people in their suffering and sustains them through it. And uh, that suffering is therefore not, you can't reason back to blessedness. You can't think because they're suffering, they're not blessed and they're not chosen of God and beloved of God. That suffering is suffering. It's not a trial. It's not some way that God's trying to perfect us. God's not closing a door to open a window. Suffering is suffering and God will meet us in that suffering and sustain us. So when it says the haughty God perceives from far away, does that just simply mean that God is not near the haughty in the way in which God is present among those who suffer? Is it about, it's the same distance, right? That God remains distanced from those? You know, that's a good question. The, um, my guess is, let me look, what verse is that? It's verse six in verse six. Hebrew. Yeah, it's, it's, um, the word perceive means more than just to perceive or oh, no, this is the same word that happens in Psalm one, uh, which uh, where it says the Lord knows the way of the righteous and it's usually translated watches over the way of the righteous. So it's to, it's to perceive and have power over in this case. That's what I thought. He sees him coming a mile away, right? He All sees right. him. And he's going to make sure, and he's going to take care of them. That's what the, that's what it means. Take care of them in the sense that they get what's coming to them. A comeuppance, if you will. A comeuppance. Okay. Which is a good word to, to work into your daily vocabulary. I love that word. It's a good and word. Watch the video just so we could see Ralph do the little seeing with his point. <laughs> that's true. That's a good reminder to those of you audio only that we are on YouTube which you can't hear Rolf sing in church, but you can watch him interpret texts. <laughs> yeah. So on the podcast. Uh, so Romans. Oh yeah. Soaring part of Romans here. Well, I think, you know, that that latter part of the passage is going to, um, it sound, will sound familiar to a lot of people with regard to, uh, uh, one body and, and the way in which uh, we have these, you know, the, these way, different gifts that will, that will sound like, you know, first Corinthians, but it's a, it's a reminder that, uh, that, that, how, that this living out of the Christian self is uh, achieved in community and, uh, and that that's, this is not sort of a self, this is not a self-help or a self-magnifying uh, kind of activity, but it's it's a it's a gift that hap it gifts that uh, that happen within the body of Christ and how central that is, and I think you know the other thing about this passage uh, that which is your spiritual worship. Spiritual is uh, probably better translated logical, uh, which is your your logical worship. In other words, uh, in in other words that how we act and our ethics or what we do uh, is, is grounded in God's mercy. Uh, that it's that, uh, you know, one of the ways we could maybe translate spiritual worship is uh, it, what is your, what is your, what is the reasonable response to God's mercy and God's grace? And, uh, and, and, and that's always a good reminder for people to, uh, to think about, you know, and especially after 9, 10, and 11 of, the, of the, the, the extraordinary grace of God to which Paul 
uh, to, to which Paul gives witness. There is a response to this, uh, but that response is, uh, it, it's a response to God's mercy that's already been extended to us, not for the sake, not, not to gain it. I love, I love this passage, and I have two questions for the three of you about this. Um, first of all, uh, first question is, living sacrifice, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, which is some sort of oxymoron, you know, that's sort of like a family vacation. It's uh, the, the, the two words nullify each other, living sacrifice. So what does that mean, to present your body as a living sacrifice? And then I'll wait for my second question after you have... Uh, cleared that up for me. The problem is the old adage goes, the problem with the living sacrifice is that you could keep, keep walking away from the altar. Um, but for me, it is this whole sense uh, of uh, pulling together uh, what Caroline said of that this is a communal act uh, that is, it is in, it lived out. It is not, um, it, it's not just, um, the idea of 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 uh, what we believe or what we say, um, uh, to use the previous uh, Romans text, but it is living it out. It is doing these uh, practices of of communal communal justice, um, and it's a sacrifice. It's not conforming to the world. I, I don't know what what would you guys say. I'd say the same. It's it's a it's a jarring image because sacrifices usually die. That's usually what what their purpose is, and it's a it's a statement here that the Christian life imagines response to God not a, not as a one time thing, not even as a special liturgical thing where you have to be in a certain space or undergoing a certain liturgy, but it's daily life worship in daily life as Ernst Kaysemann's famous essay about this passage, that the, the manner in which we conduct ourselves is the way in which the place in which we give praise to God. And it's, it's done out of a sense, not necessarily of obligation, but like Caroline said, it's logical or fitting, right? Given all that God is, all that who God is and what God has done, what else would be more appropriate than a life lived like this? Because but it's done through living. It's not done through. Christ gave his body for death. Righteousness is worked out literally through his body. Our bodies now live in righteousness. It's that kind of a, a pulling together of so many terms and themes that we've seen in this letter. That'll preach. What they said. So my other question then is, uh, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, uh, or hearts. I can't remember what the actual Greek is, but it's uh, new sits minds. Um, so um, do not be conformed to the world. I get that, you know, you can see all the ways the world tries to get us to conform. Uh, what does it mean to be transformed, metamorphosed, that I think is the Greek, uh, by the renewing of the mind? Caroline set us up for this as she started when she talked about, I think it was you that started talking about this is the mercies of God. Um, that this is not a political position. Uh, this is not uh, um, a, a institutional equity that we're trying to get, or this isn't because we're part of this right group or you know, our people. This is God's mercy. And when we begin to allow our imaginations to say, this is God's mercies, not my nation, not my people, not my, not my institution, um, that is not conforming to the world because the world is constantly putting up these other alternatives. Uh, and, and for us to say, nope, this is God's kingdom. This is God's grace. This is God's idea. And that becomes, um, to use the word sacrifice, that becomes a life-threatening claim. Once again, I agree <laughs> with everything Joy has said, right? We could talk about this linguistically, or we could talk about, like, what, is, what do these words mean? Or we could talk about it as 
determining to live in a different reality, not to live differently, not to will yourself to a certain kind of ethic, but to recognize you now live a different reality than the rest of the world. This is Paul's apocalyptic gospel of a of an inbreaking that reveals to you a totally different order, a totally different way in which God is now present in the world.